to the dog show. In this episode, I interview Robert Cabral. So Robert's a canine behavior specialist whose work has helped dogs all over the world. His theories and techniques are used by animal shelters in the United States to deal with difficult dogs and help make them more adoptable. He's considered one of the top dog trainers anywhere. We talk about the principles of dog training, mistakes many owners make, and a bunch of extra helpful tips about training dogs for owners. I learned a huge amount once again in this episode, and I hope you do too. So Robert, thanks so much for coming on the dog show today. Uh, really excited to interview you. Um, could you give me a bit of a background with your history with dogs just to, to kick things off? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. I am really happy to be here. Dogs really have always been a part of my life since I was just looking at pictures yesterday with my girlfriend and there's all these pictures of me as a young, young boy, like in not even a year old, several months old, with my arms around dogs, hugging dogs, playing with dogs. And that was uh, when I lived in Rhode Island. We moved to Germany for a while. The people who lived downstairs there had dachshunds, fell in love with them, always playing with them. And then we moved back to the States. And um, eventually we got some dogs where we, you know, with us. And um, when I lived on my own, I really didn't have dogs for the first uh, 20 some odd years of living here in California. So I worked as a bodyguard photographer, so I was quite busy. All right. But um, I rescued a Sharpay and that was the end of it. From there on in, I just started, you know, I trained him. And then uh, my veterinarian started getting me into dog training, referring me to clients. And from there, it just kind of dominoed. Oh, that's cool. So at the moment, you have five dogs, I think you told me. Is that right? Yeah, we've got five dogs. We've got a, a German Shepherd, a Belgian Malinois, a mini Dachshund, and two Labrador Retrievers. Okay. And they and were they all rescued or? No, uh, one was rescued. One was given to me by a client, so it was kind of a rescue. Yeah. And the other ones were from breeders. Okay. Okay. So do you have a, I guess it's probably a silly question, do you have a favorite breed of dog at all? or? <laughs> For me, I would probably have to say, you know, I like the herding breeds. Okay. I, heard, I like Malinois for me. I think it's really, people always ask me that question, what's your favorite breed? Yeah. And it's always a two-part question. Well, for me, it's a Malinois. Okay. But for other people, probably would definitely not be a Malinois. What's, a, what's an interesting fact about that breed that, that someone might not know? It's Well, I think people know and they still get hooked into it. It's just a super, super hard uh, dog to live with. They're very, very high drive. Okay. Goofy. Hey. Like he's doing over there. Um, they're super high drive. They're always getting into something. Um, they can be the best dogs in the world, or they can be the hardest dogs in the world to live with. Okay. So they need a bit of space as well, or space, not as much attention though. Okay. And you, know, you need a lot of attention. They need to be always work. They need to be, you know, like he's ten years old and he still acts like a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He still gets into stuff and whatever. You know, it's it's just a it's a very high drive, high intensity dog. Okay. Okay. So I guess it's it's good for someone that's always active with their dogs, though. Yeah, so especially someone who knows how to train dogs. You know, someone yeah. who's really skilled in it. It's, it's going to be a lot better dog. It's a fun dog if you're super involved, super hands-on, and, and very knowledgeable with dogs. Yeah. But people get them and they say, well, you know, I can take them for a walk two, three times a day, and that's just not enough. It's it's got a, it's incredible mental and physical stimulation. Yeah. This is a, a bit of a, a left field question, but because you're a dog trainer, are you spending every day? teaching your dogs things or is it about um, just applying disciplines every day? Well, it's about applying disciplines, about really being on top of your dog. It's just something, you know, I worked as a bodyguard for many, many years. So I still sit with my, you know, I can't sit with my back to a door. Okay. So, you know, being a dog trainer, I'm always on. Like whenever I see a dog, I'm always managing the dog. Okay. Um, and that's not saying if they're on their own, I'm doing it. But if they're doing something, I'm always watching. I'm always, I've always got a watchful eye. But um, yeah, it, it just, it, you don't really, you train a lot, you know, I'll take them outside and maybe work 15 minutes a couple times a day to do something to kind of polish their skills on something they need to know, like a scent detection exercise or a precision exercise. But other than that, I mean, no, you're not really, I mean, I don't teach them something new all the time. Yeah. My dogs are very good at what they know, but I don't, I'm not the guy whose dog knows, you know, a hundred tricks. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> How did you like? You mentioned briefly how you got into dog training, but how did yeah. you? How did you? How did it progress into you know what it is today with the YouTube channel and all that kind of stuff? It's so funny because I um, a friend of mine, Jeff, said, you know, Robert, what you should do is you should put a YouTube channel together and give people tell them everything you know. And I said, well, if I tell them everything I know, <laughs> then they'll never come to me to train their dogs. 
Yeah. And he said, it's quite the opposite. You'll see. And I thought, well, this is a good thing because, I mean, I live in a really nice part of the country where people can afford my rates. And I thought, well, there's a lot of people who can't afford to hire me. And it would be a very fair gift, you know, in trying to be more altruistic to help people who can't really afford me to give them some information for free. Yeah. And if they're willing to do the hard work of deciphering through the videos and the instruction, then I think that's a fair gift to kind of give back because I'm really giving it to the dogs. Whenever I train somebody, um, I'm helping their dog, not necessarily them as much. Um, if the dog will get, won't get abused. The dog will have a much more a fair relationship with the person and the dog will end up not in, ending up in a shelter. Okay. And I guess you've got, a, it gives you a global reach as well doesn't it? So yeah. yeah, I mean, I've got reach everywhere yeah. in the world. I've, I, there's so many, every time, you know, someone sends me a message and it's like, I'm surprised because okay, there's another country that we just reached. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I guess just to explode. I mean, as you said, you, you live in California, so you've got a, yeah. a small amount of owners and dogs that you can influence, but sure. Um, and that's the key thing, you know, I mean, that's why I started my, my nonprofit bound angels was to kind of help dogs that, that are in need. And that's yeah. really the, the great picture of it. You know, you're doing a good, thing for people who you can reach but there's with one video i can reach tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people where you know teaching one person their dog it's kind of like very difficult to make that same impact yeah so with bound angels you're teaching um the people that work at shelters how to train dogs so there's less likelihood of them getting put down or is that is that kind of the gist it, yeah, it is. It's, so I teach people who work in shelters, whether they're volunteers or um, people who work in the shelters, trainers or behaviorists or just sh sh uh, kennel attendants. And it's twofold. One is how to train the dogs to give them the structure, but more importantly, how to understand the dogs, how to understand a specific behavior that could end up, you know, um, having a dog be euthanized for. Okay. Okay. Um, so I guess that would be typically aggressive style behaviors and that, that kind of stuff or? It can be aggression is one thing, but aggression is often misunderstood too. You know, often the dog is reactive or reactive to something that they're not sure of. Um, aggression comes out of a twofold pocket, and the first one is fear, and the other one is dominance. So, okay. you know, just to understand those things better for employees gives them a better scope of how to, you know, also how to keep them safer. You know, okay. maybe there's certain things they're not seeing warning signals. Okay. I was listening to um, one of your podcast episodes earlier about puppies and mm -hmm. what I found interesting is you talk about the formative years and how important it is for, you know, the, the long life of the dog in terms of their behavior yeah. and everything like that. Um, yeah. I guess the, the old saying is you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but um, in, in some, to some extent you're trying to do that by in the shelters and things like that. How, how hard is it to, to teach a dog or I guess, um, move them away from behaviors that you don't like, such as aggression mm -hmm. or things like that, uh, later, later in, their, in their life? Well, you know, a lot of times dogs become aggressive or reactive based on their environment. So I've seen dogs in shelters that are super aggressive and you take them out and they never show another sign of aggression. And I've seen dogs from shelters that you take out that have no signs of aggression that later develop that or kind of show it. So my theory on it is a dog will kind of show you what it needs to show you at that moment, right? But a, a dog really can't hide. Like a dog is a, is a wide open book. Like if I look at a dog, I can tell pretty much, I would say pretty much, not 100%, but you know, in the high 90 percentile, what that dog is thinking. Okay. Because dogs communicate through body language. We communicate verbally, dogs communicate physically through body language. So you can kind of read those signals and kind of know what's up with the dog. But the idea of not teaching old dog new tricks, I think that is, is a misnomer because I do think you can teach an old dog new tricks. The thing is a lot of behaviors, especially instinctual behaviors or hardwired behaviors become very set into the dog. And so you don't undo them, mm. you end up managing them. And that helps the dog to better understand their place in society and it helps you to better understand how to manage that dog in society. Okay, so are you looking to remove environmental triggers i guess if, if you're trying you can't to, right you can't yeah. i mean that's always that, that's always the thing so people say well my dog's reactive to other dogs i'm just going to keep him away from other dogs but that's you know in today's society that's i mean now it's easy but you know yeah. with, with, the, with the virus but um in normalcy it's, it's 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 almost impossible how do you keep dogs away from other dogs you know there's going to be a dog off a leash there's going to be a dog that's going to bark from across the street or something like that so what you really want to learn is the skill how to best manage that dog 
how to okay. best figure out how to control that dog should that arise, should that kind of a situation arise. And that's why I think management, aggression, I really have an issue with trainers on the internet who talk about um, they fix aggression. Hmm. You, you don't fix, if you don't fix aggression, because there's nothing broken in the dog. What you're, when you fix aggression, like a lot of people say, there's a lot of fantastic trainers out there. I'm not slamming all of them. I'm only slamming the cowboys who are out there saying they're going to fix stuff. Mm -hmm. They've never worked with real dogs that have se severe issues. Um, but you don't fix things. You manage them, mm -hmm. and you kind of deal with them. It's like a person who has mental, you know, mental illness. You don't just wave a magic wand and make it better. Even if you give them psycho, you know, psychotropic drugs or whatever it's called, you know, antidepressant drugs, you're kind of just masking and managing that emotion in the in the person. It's the same thing with the dog. So you mentioned, I guess, that we talk through, you know a whole bunch of different ways, but dogs talk predominantly through their body language. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, I, I guess um, it, would you find a lot of owners, and I'm sure that I'm in this boat, my, my wife often t says, oh, our dog's smiling. I'm like, I don't think it's smiling. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That they misinterpret the behavior of dogs, like the, the body language of dogs? Or... Well, I mean, I, I do think dogs smile, so it's maybe something you want to look at because you, okay. know, you can see a dog smiling. I mean, they, they do have the same smiling kind of mouth okay. when they smile. But um, what you want to look at with a dog, and I talk, talk about this a lot in my workshops, is, and this is mainly with shelters I'm talking about here, mm. is look at the whole dog, right? So a dog could be wagging its tail, and you're always happy he's wagging his tail, and he's going to bite somebody because mm. you weren't looking at, you know, the, the ears being pinned back or the, you know, or the, or the, the hackles being up on the dog. Really with a dog, the only picture you need to get of a dog is the whole picture, Okay. Individual pieces don't necessarily mean anything. Okay. So back to training for a second. Do you have a yeah. set of principles you follow when trying to train a dog something? Um, do you want to yeah. just take, take me through that? I have an old, uh, my, my saying is everything I do with the dog starts with a toy and a treat. Where it goes from there is up to the dog. Okay. Right? So everything in my philosophy of training a dog must start with one, a relationship and two, a desire of the dog to want to please me. Mm -hmm. So I want the dog to, first of all, look to me as somebody he wants to be with and he wants to do something for. And then two, I want to give him a reason to do that. That means there's a reward. That can be a treat. It can be a toy. It can be a pat on the head. It can be an attaboy or anything like that. But th that's where everything must, must start with the dog. You know, we can take a dog that maybe has some, you know, an aggression or reactivity issue if it's dominance based and use more of a compulsion, you know, or a, a, a correction on the dog to get it to not do it. But what we really want to do to train a dog is to form a relationship and form habits, form behaviors on the dog and then use those and put them on cue. Okay. Okay. So. Would you say how important is like repetition and everything like that when you're trying to teach a dog something? Huge. Yeah. You know, I think I think the biggest failure of people is that they end up giving up too soon. Okay. I've had dogs where it took me an entire, you know, forty minute session to get them to lie down yeah. with using a treat to get a proper down. And I mean I could have done it with a prong collar or an electric collar or yanked them down or done that, but I didn't really think it was necessary. Now, that's not saying I'm against prong collars, e-collars, or anything like that. I think every tool has a place for mm -hmm. a dog, but I think most tools are just, you know, it's a generic tool. It's like I get a remote collar, and everybody gets a remote collar, and they start pushing buttons, pushing buttons. That doesn't solve the problem, right? It's not a remote-controlled dog. It's actually a living, breathing, thinking uh, being that has feelings and emotions like us. Um, to train them, we need to connect with them. And I think that's kind of void in a lot of training methods, whether it's the all positive or the all compulsion. I think these trainers are overlooking the, 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 the cognitive, the mental aspect, the, the emotional aspect of the dog and just thinking, I, I said, sit, you got to sit. And if it's not working with a treat. I need to get a different treat. No, there might be a reason the dog's not sitting, right? Mm -hmm. The dog might not be clear on what you want him to do. The dog might have an ache or a pain or the dog might be uncomfortable or fearful or dominant. Those are things we need to look at when we examine the whole dog. And that's what any good dog trainer is a, is a master at doing this, mm. figuring that out. It's communication. Would, would a dog, does a dog forget something? Because I guess um, if they're not doing it regularly or is it something, is, if you teach a dog, you know, to lie down or to sit or whatever mm -hmm. it is, they seem to kind of remember that for a long, long time. 
Sure. Well, I mean, do people forget things? And it's the exact same thing. And when you look like at any riding, mammal, riding a bike thing, I guess. Yeah, it's the same thing. You know, we forget things, yeah. but if we're reminded, then we remember it more quickly than if we're yeah. first taught it. Exact same situation with the dog. You know, really, you got to look at the dog. And I think this is one of my main things I try to preach in, 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 my, in my, my, my lectures is please understand that the dog is an emotional creature. Mm. He might be having a good day. He might be having a bad day. He might be happy. He might be sad. He might be stubborn. He might be, you know, uh, easy. But those are all things you got to look at and understand when you work with a dog. Yeah. Um, how much variance is there between different breeds? I mean, you hear people talk about smarter dog breeds like your German Shepherds and things like that. But when, when training a dog, how much variance is there? Um, I mean, there is. It's not, you know, they say the Border Collie and the Malinois are the most intelligent dogs, which I okay. probably would agree with. But what you're really looking for in a dog is the biddability of the dog. So how willing is the dog to work with you? You know, you can have a super smart dog like a border collie, and it's very, very difficult to train because it's so smart, it's actually outthinking you. Right? There's been times where with Goofy, um, he knows hand signals and verbals on on things like sit down and stand. Well, if I move my hand a certain way, he he predicts something's coming and he might do something I don't want him to do. So he's already outthinking me. Where you know, a dog that's more simple and more biddable, like a Labrador retriever is oftentimes an easier dog to train because they're kind of just saying, okay, make it clear what you want, mm -hmm. and then they'll do it. But it's, it's a tough one. It's a real tough line because you don't want a dog that's completely, you know, like hounds, for example, they're more stubborn and aloof dogs than, you know, than gun dogs like, like retrievers or, or herding dogs. And you kind of want to go into the, the, the groups of the dogs as opposed to the individual breeds because that's going to give you a better picture. So like is a, you know, a German Shepherd and a Border Collie and a Malinois intelligent. Well, they're all three members of the herding group. And the reason they're in that group is because they work well at a distance. They work well in looking and relating to a person where a, a, a retriever works much better on their own. They're set out. They're going to go out. They're going to get the bird. They're going to come back with the bird unless I blow a whistle and tell them to do something different. They're not looking for any interference where the herders are always looking for it. Now what? Now what? Now what? It's a different relationship. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a real life scenario here and I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on it. Sure. I have a, a French bulldog. My wife and I have a French bulldog. She's four years old now and she has a, like, I think she has an amazing personality, very loyal, um, you know, doesn't show any, like great with kids. She's grown up with kids um, and, and all that kind of stuff. One thing that we struggle with still, and it's probably because we didn't socialize her with other dogs enough when she was younger, I think that's my assumption. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, is we'll take her to the dog park. Um, and for the most part, she'll be, she'll be good. She'll like, she, she's very energetic, loves jumping, bounding around, right. jump, like playing with other dogs. Uh -huh. But it's almost like she picks out the dogs that don't want to play with her <laughs> um, right. and like goes over to them. And if they don't give her attention, she'll kind of jump at their face a little bit. Like there's no, right. there's no, she's not trying to bite them or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But like, mm -hmm. she's basically trying to piss them off until they do something. I don't know. That's what it looks right. like. Um, what, what would you do in that situation? Well, I mean, I, I, strongly caution people to stay away from dog parks for and it might be different in in australia where you are or in, in your particular area of australia but mm. um for the most part what happens in dog parks is dogs that don't know each other are vying for position and trying to develop a higher hierarchy right which mm. happens anywhere you go and if you go to a bar you're trying to figure out okay who's the tougher guy who's this who's that because it's it's more more so with dogs because dogs are much more primal than us but they're constantly looking for that. Even in play, the, the, the reason dogs play is because they play in a methodology that would help them to fight. Mm. Just like if you watch a lion cub you know, playing, they're playing in a way that, okay, I'm practicing my fighting skills. That's okay. what predators do. So when you take a dog to a dog park, and I'll get back to the question of your dog, but when you take a dog to a dog park, that jockeying for position is always kind of going on to some degree or another. Now, people who go to a dog park who, you know, I'm meeting five of my friends with five dogs we know at a dog park, mm. I got no problem with it. I think dogs are very social animals mm. and they enjoy their interaction with each other, whether you have five dogs in your own home or you've got a bunch of friends, you put together a group of dogs. The issue comes in when there's unfamiliarity and a difference of, of temperaments, mm. some dominant dogs, some aloof dogs, some fearful dogs, 
and, and then that comes together and a fearful dog sees a dog jumping in their face as a threat and will bite. Mm. Where a really clear headed dominant dog sees you jumping in his face and he's like, you know what, I'm just not going to do this. Mm. And he's going to blow it off. So when you have your dog doing that, yeah, obviously she's looking for something to instigate or to initiate because it's something that's not normal. Everybody else is playing with her. You're not playing. Why aren't you playing? And she susses that out. Mm. And, and Frenchies are super um, cordial with people. They're super fun. Mm. They can have aggression issues to people because they're so baby and cute. So they never really learn that structure. And that can be with any dog, right? Mm. That's not just alone to a Frenchie, but usually dogs that are more lap dogs or really, you know, cute looking dogs that attract a certain type of owner who are just going to coddle them and baby them. Well, they're going to, they're going to have more of that issue than a dog that's given structure through its whole life. Okay. So I guess what you're saying um, is you're better off to socialize dogs in an environment where you know the owners, you know the other dogs, there's some sort of comfort level there, um, yeah. more so than going into a park where there's all sorts of different dogs that you don't really know. Um, it could yeah, be you want you want to remove the variables. Mm. So, you know, people always say that I did a program where I taught um, shelters, animal shelters, how to put together play groups. And I did it very different. There's, there's I think, maybe two of us in, in America really doing the play groups in a certain way. Two organizations. One is Bound Angels and there's another one. And my methodology to putting dogs together in play groups is very strict. It's very hands-on. It's very structured. I never let the dogs work it out because I think dogs make bad decisions. Mm. So what I do is I structure the introduction and I structure the interactions. And my, my, my partner and I, who did the program, we would have between 10, 15, 17 pit bulls, big pit bulls, powerful dogs in one yard at one time, dogs that had never met before. And we could do that because we completely managed the situation. So the dogs never had an opportunity to do something stupid. Right? I mean, that's a, it's a bad word to use, but they, they really never had a chance to jump in somebody's face. Because the minute they did, we were on top of them telling them, hey, knock it off. And people say, well, you're micromanaging the dogs. You're doing this, you're doing that. But in 10 plus years of doing that, I can honestly say I've never had one serious injury that even required one stitch. Yeah. And nobody can say that. No, no other organization can say that. No other trainer can say that. But it's because he and I managed this program in a way that the dog had a great time, right? They actually, they didn't only get to play, but they learned a skill that will keep them alive and get them to play more. Yeah. So okay. it's controlling the environment. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks for that advice. Yeah. <laughs> Apologize yeah. for jumping down my own path, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be helpful for other people out there about um, socializing the dogs and, and dealing with that behavior anyway. Yeah, please keep him out of dog parks because once yeah. a dog, you know, if you have a really good natured dog and he gets nailed by a dog really hard, especially early on, that dog will always have this suspicion in his mind mm. and that suspicion will lead to fear or dominance. Mm. And people don't want to believe it, but I've trained a lot of dogs in my time and I can tell you that dogs that have had negative you know, in, in interactions with other dogs early on usually end up not being the nicest dogs. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because I we actually had an experience when our dog was a puppy. Uh, we had a, a Labrador that was staying at our house for a few weeks as a friend's Labrador, and they were a, bit, a lot mm -hmm. older, eight years old. When we like our dog was you know six months old, yeah, um, and it showed quite a lot of aggressive tendencies towards our puppy, growling, kind of not mm -hmm. not being very interactive, and obviously the puppy yeah. just wanted to play the whole time. Um, sure, and we and we often wonder we had to separate them. We ended up like sending the dog back to another friend to look after yeah. because it was kind of at that point that they had to be fully separated. We weren't sure yeah. what was going to happen. So, sure. I, I mean, I, I wonder if a, a, like a, an experience like that could have influenced the behavior as, as she's got older. It could have. Yeah. You know, it could have. I mean, look at people who are emotionally or physically abused as children usually turn out to be, you know, very different than people who weren't. Mm. So if you had to give our listeners one big takeaway from today's show, what would that be, do you think? Learn to understand that your dog is a living, breathing, thinking, emotional creature, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not an object, right? It requires structure first. Dogs see life through structure, then love. Humans see life through love, then structure. Okay. Um, and, and give a dog a fair chance because all the work you do with your dog, all the training you do, all the structured interactions you do will help that dog live a very, very happy life and the dog will die in your arms as opposed to on a cold table in a shelter. And that's 
been the core of my mission is to make sure that dogs stay with their families forever and that more structure you give them, the more interaction you give them, and the more you understand that it is a living, breathing creature with its own set of emotions and feelings, then you'll have a much better chance of giving that dog. You're the custodian of that dog. You got to give it the best chance you can. That's great advice. So structure first, love second. Where can people find out about, uh, about more about you, Robert? Well, the easiest way is if you go to my site, robertcabral.com, there's links there to my YouTube channel, my membership section, my Bound Angels, every single thing, just on the front of that page. Yeah, and I highly recommend checking out the YouTube channel. It's very, very helpful. So thank you. Thanks, thanks so much for coming on the interview today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me.